Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our chats with Emily as we are calling our readings through the 1,775 poems of Emily Dickinson contained within the Johnson edition. We turn out a poem 62, a remarkable little poem, Sown in Dishonor. Do notice that the quotation marks are around the first line of Sown in Dishonor. And here we're back to Emily's great challenge to authority, especially, of course, her iconoclastic Promethean-like challenge to biblical texts and especially to the voice of St. Paul, who she's going to address directly in this poem. Now, this is one of the challenges, guys. We read some of these poems today, and we do not come fully loaded, if I can use that technological language, we don't come fully loaded with all of the prior knowledge that Emily will assume of her audience. Namely, of course, biblical knowledge. So I'm going to have to help you guys a little bit here. But I will point out to you that St. Paul is the guy who in one of his writings suggested that women were to keep silent in church. Something that Emily obviously struggled with was this idea that authority might be able to say to her, we don't need you to talk anymore. She will come right to it in a poem like this, which is what makes it so much fun for us. Now our assumptions that you've been following LearnStrong.net down the left hand side chats with Emily our playlist I'm hopeful that you are already exposed to a set of introductory comments that we've given in as well I'm hopeful that you've worked through the preceding 61 poems we just finished with Papa above another referencing to theology and to uh, religious views so here we'll be playing a similar game now <clears throat> to understand this poem the only way you can understand this poem is to work with uh, 1 Corinthians 15 that famous passage in the Christian uh, corpus of the idea of the afterlife and resurrection. So Paul has a challenge in front of him, and starting at verse 36 in the King James Version of the Bible, which you have to read if you're going to appreciate Emily's language, because two times she's going to reference directly from this passage. This is how Paul will speak about the body versus the soul, about living in this world, and then, of course, uh, resurrection. This passage of 1 Corinthians 15 is famous for its resurrection theme. Starting at verse 36 of 1 Corinthians 15, it reads like this, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. The seed has to come into the ground covered, it must die. The seed must die for there to be growth. A famous, a famous motif, of course. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it please, at his, as it hath pleased him to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Now to, now to verse 42, 43, where we're going to really focus. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, that is the physical body goes into the ground. It is raised in incorruption, the idea of the resurrection. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body, there's a natural body, and there is a spiritual body, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. And finally, 48, 49, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. In other words, the body is being somehow discounted and the soul is being elevated. Now, of course, this is just pure Platonism as well for those of us who have studied our Phaedo, uh, Plato's Phaedo, or for example, the Republic. Um, and we'll make more maybe comments about that here at the end of our lecture. Now, again, Emily's Promethean relationship, I'll call it that, 
uh, to Christianity and to biblical text will be on full display here. I'm also going to point out that this is a very transcendentalist reading. There's a lot of Emerson and Thoreau that will play out in this reading as well. Um, some people have said, Emily is not really a transcendentalist, and it's a poem like this that makes us maybe begin to question that view. Notice, right away from 1 Corinthians 15, 43, she'll invert 43 to 42, and she'll begin with the quote, sown in dishonor. Notice it's in quotation marks, but then there's an exclamation point. We have a 10 line poem where there are eight exclamation points. Why? I think Emily's trying to make her point as forcefully as she can. Sown in dishonor. Ah, indeed. May this dishonor be? If I were half so fine myself, I'd notice nobody. Sown in corruption. Not so fast. Apostle is askew. Corinthians 1.15 narrates a circumstance or two now, there is just so much going on in this poem. The fact that she will end with the word two and the fact that Paul is playing the platonic game of dualism, the body and the soul, all of that to me is truly remarkable in a poem like this. Notice she'll begin with sown in dishonor, but she doesn't mention 1 Corinthians 15 until later in the poem. She will assume, however, because there's quotation marks around it, that any reader of the poem would know immediately she's referencing this famous passage of St. Paul from 1 Corinthians 15, which we just read. Her use of ah is ubiquitous through her poems. We saw it for the first time in poem 34. It's almost as if she wants to interrupt herself. It's almost as if at times it's comedic, like ah, like well, let's have a little fun. And then the, her use of the word indeed will tell you right away that maybe she's not agreeing with this idea that the body is a production, a natural production, and therefore it is dishonorable. In other words, there's something wrong with the body. The soul is all that matters, and that's, of course, going to be St. Paul's argument, and obviously it's going to be Paul's argument, Plotinus's argument. We're familiar with this idea. She says, may this dishonor be. Notice the, the italics for this. May this dishonor be. In other words, Emily is going to celebrate the body. Sounding very much like Emerson, very much like Thoreau. She's going to challenge this very much like Walt Whitman. Of course, we've just given uh, all those lectures on every poem in Leaves of Grass. You can find that as Talks with Walt at LearnStrong.net. But go back to all of the things that he will do, Whitman, as he celebrates the body in those early poems of Song of Myself. Obviously controversial, no doubt. She says, may this dishonor be, if I were half so fine myself, I'd notice nobody. Now, of course, we're going to enjoy her use of nobody when we get to poem 288. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'll advertise. You know, how dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog to tell one's name the live long June to admiring bog. Now, of course, the nobody reference here is obviously along with poem 288 to Odysseus in that cave with Polyphemus the Cyclops when the Cyclops asks him, who are you? And Odysseus says, I'm nobody. And of course, Odysseus blinds Polyphemus and Polyphemus will tell the Cyclops brethren, I was blinded by nobody. Ha ha. And of course, children love that. I love the idea though that she uses this idea of nobody. If I, she says, just could appreciate and enjoy my own body, I wouldn't need to see any other bodies. I'd be so blown away by my own body. I'm not sure about this whole notion of, first of all, dishonor, and then notice back to 1 Corinthians 15, now 42, sown in corruption. This idea that the human body is somehow fundamentally corrupted, and that leads her, of course, to one of the great lines only used one time in all of her corpus, not so fast. And of course, this not so fast, it's an interesting line. I mean, it's an interesting line to try and run to ground. You've probably heard it before when somebody says, not so fast. And yet here it is, not so fast. In other words, let's think about this for a second. Apostle is askew. Now, of course, <laughs> this, is, this, this is just directly, I'm not sure about what Paul thinks is so true. Uh, by the way, the word askew only gets used one time in all of our poems, and it's here. Um, now, of course, Orthodox readers of the Pauline text of 1 Corinthians 15 will immediately sit up when they hear her say, I'm not sure he understands exactly what he's saying. And then she mentions it as Corinthians 1.15, narrates a circumstance or two. Now, what exactly is it that she's doing in a very controversial poem like this? Well, I think what she's doing is she's challenging this idea that there's something fundamentally wrong with the body, and there's something 
beautiful and pure about the soul. And the soul should not in any way want to be a part of the body. Emily will look at a very earthy, note, notice back to 1 Corinthians 15 from the King James Version of the Bible, a very earthy celebration of the human body. And I think at 2A what she's really saying is that our earthly bodies are in fact wonderful. And she'll ask this question, how is it possible that something could be corrupted and yet raised to power and glory. I mean, how does that even work out? It seems to me that if the soul is going to, if the soul is amazing, power and glory, and it's going to be contained in any kind of container, that container has got to be also of a, a part of power and glory. She just is not going to buy this notion that the human body is this disgusting, gross thing, and somehow or another out of that comes this majestic soul. She's just not going to buy it. At 2B, I love the allusion to 1 Corinthians 15, this famous passage on resurrection, where she'll argue that Paul's theology is, as she calls it, askew to rhyme with two. And of course, the dualism is ubiquitous there in the passage itself, and obviously she's tipping her hat to Plato's Phaedo at 3a. I love as well that it's so close in time that Whitman himself will be writing in Song of Myself 48, a passage that we explicate in Talks to Walt, you'll recall, where he says it, I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I've said that the body is not more than the soul, and nothing, not God, is greater to one than oneself is. Whoa! It is amazing to me that during this window of time, Emerson and Thoreau Walt and Emily are all playing this game of, we're not going to say contradicting scriptural text, but we're certainly going to expand the text, no doubt about that. And finally, at 3b, what are your thoughts about the, the human body? Do you see it as something worthy of celebration, or rather something to kind of be perceived as dishonorable or corrupt? I think Emily will challenge us to read all kinds of sacred texts from a different perspective. Hurrah! Thank you.